I have a really robust vegetable and fruit garden that I do every year. My husband built me a huge raised bed and it's kind of cool because our tomatoes get so tall. We built it right up to our fence in our community that goes over and it feeds everybody. Everybody walks by and picks tomatoes off of it at the end nice. of the year because we can't keep up with it. So it's really cool. But we oh make like pickles and pickles and... Oh my word, I've got this image of you as a 12 year old girl now <laughs> decoding all of these like <laughs> cones and like growing these tomatoes, like being like, woo, I love this. <laughs> I love this. Welcome, Jenny Bristow, to this episode of The Women Your Mother Warns You About with uh, myself, Gina Tremarco, and my amazing co host. You want to say your name? Susanna Gray Jones. <laughs> and can I just say, sometimes you get guests who come into the Zoom room. And you know, they're going to be a lot of fun. And I'm getting that vibe from you, Jenny. I think you're going to be a, a great guest. And thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Well, Jenny, could you give our listeners just kind of a quick recap, a quick intro to who you are and maybe one thing that you're like, hey, I really want to talk about this today. Yeah. So I am in St. Louis, Missouri, in the United States. And I own a marketing agency. We specialize in working with hospital systems and healthcare providers. And we specifically focus on the nerdy marketing. So anything with analytics, data, um, you know, anything that is based off of more technical aspects. Um, and what I'd love to talk about is the rebrand that we just went through, Ooh. because it's something that I think um, brought up a lot of really interesting questions with my team around questions we were asked that we didn't expect to be asked. Um, and kind of the purpose and passion behind it. It's just a really fun conversation. Ooh, is that I you? I don't it. think anyone's ever come onto the podcast from what I've seen and talked about rebranding. And I completely agree. No. It's such such an, such an interesting topic. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's some parallels to it, right? Because we have to think about brand in general. But <laughs> rebrand, right? I went through that in 2016 mm -hmm. um, with my company because before I was with Sales Gravy because I owned an improv comedy theater. But within that organization, we had a training division and we ran into some serious challenges from a sales perspective of being kind of pigeonholed into this comedy box of like, oh no, we don't hire you. It's just comedy. And they couldn't see beyond the value. Like they, we had a really hard time breaking out of the, you know, your, the funny brand. So we had to actually rebrand the division into its own company. So yeah, I'll let Jenny jump in on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me tell you the story in the background Please. a little bit, if that would be helpful to set the stage. Yes, so, yes, yes. So I started the company over seven years ago. It was named Anvil Analytics and Insights. So again, very much pigeonholed us into the nerdy side of marketing, like you were just talking about, Gina. But I bought my business partner out last year to become a 100% owner. And we also started really focusing on healthcare about two years ago. And at this point, we're about 80% healthcare. Wow. Um, and interesting about healthcare is people that work in healthcare typically could make larger salaries if they worked somewhere else, right? Like they chose to work in a marketing department of a hospital system because they want to help people. They want to give back. And so wonderful people to work with generally. Our clients are absolutely amazing. And we started getting this feedback that Anvil did not represent us. Most of my employees are like me, bubbly, fun, um, you know, really excited to solve problems for people. And so we went through a whole rebranding exercise and we came up with the name Hetty and Hop. So it what it stands not. for mm -hmm, is uh, two women that are really big in um, tech and innovation. Um, so first is Grace Hopper. So Grace Hopper is a innovator that was actually in the military and she helped develop one of the first programming languages. So... She was so good that at the age of 60, the military recalled her and made her come back into service because they needed her still. And she wasn't wow. allowed to retire until she was 79. Wow. <laughs> she was wait, wait, wait. She wasn't allowed to retire? Well, they needed her. Yeah. So she loved it. She was passionate. Yeah, nice. So she was happy to be there, I'm sure. Um, but she also is the woman who popularized the word computer bug because a moth literally flew into her computer. <laughs> wow. So, I didn't know that. Yeah, and she really helped encourage young people, male and female, to learn how to code and to get into programming. 
On the other side, the other part of our name is Hedy for Hedy Lamar. So most of you probably hear the name Hedy Lamar and think about an Austrian actress. Mm-hmm. She was absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. Snow you know, White was modeled after her. But a lot of people don't know that whenever she moved to the United States, she actually wanted to help the United States during World War II. And so she developed a frequency hopping technology that led to modern day GPS and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Wow. She patented it, tried to give it to the U.S. military, and they refused to use it until after her patent wore out. So she died without ever receiving a penny for her patent. What the what? And she was never celebrated as a tech innovator. So our brand is celebrating innovators, regardless of if you show up the way society wants you to or not. Because if you're (sighs) contributing to society, then you should be recognized and acknowledged. But then we also were doing an artist in residency program. So once a year, we're choosing an artist to lift up and give visibility. Uh, This year's artist is a woman named Jessica Hitchcock, um, and she's a painting artist. And so we're using scans of her artwork for social media, website, everything. It's a paid stipend every year that she gets to kind of like lift up small business owners and provide visibility to people. But the interesting thing about all of this is whenever we're talking about this and telling people our new brand, one of the first questions I get from men every single time is, so do you only work with women? Oh, I was thinking that. I mean, is that bad? <laughs> I was thinking, this is great that you are celebrating women. Um, is, there, is, is there a theme here then? But what's interesting is whenever companies are named after men, nobody asks that question backwards. Oh, right? yeah, so that's why such do a good point. Question? And males and females think the same thing. There are so many companies named after men, whether it's their last name, if it's whatever, and nobody ever says, well, are women not allowed in this space? Well, you, you know, what's interesting is, is that this show is in its third season and it's called The Women Your Mother Warned You mm-hmm. About. And the first thing that we're asked is, is it just for women, Right. And it's really, it just happens to be run by women your mother warned you about. Yep. Right. But if you look at our guests, yes. right there, it's men and women mm-hmm. and, it, and it's evolved too, right? It's evolved because part of the brand behind it when we first started it was we wanted to be two women who are like, hey, we don't want to. We don't want to conform to what everybody is telling us to be and do and say. We just want to be who we are. And by the way, we love men. Yep, for sure. But we still run into that of like, is this just for women? No, we love you, men. We want men. Exactly. I And that's why I thought it'd be such an interesting topic. Because I have male clients we adore working with. We have male employees, male vendors. I mean, I'm married to an amazing man. I mean, we clearly <laughs> love men. but so the the dichotomy between the different way people interpret brands and the word is just very interesting in society yeah definitely and I think one of the reasons that I particularly love doing this podcast which is probably my most interactive social exciting (laughs) engagement all week (laughs) is because we oh we forgot to pour the wine well we did we didn't pour the wine tonight um, oh, not gosh. this time, um, but it's because <laughs> we get to speak to so many like-minded women um, who have that passion and that drive and it's infectious, it's contagious, it's just, uh, you don't see it often enough, in my opinion, in great. women. And you can, and it's not just one degree of woman, is it? You get lots of different degrees of women and all of our guests are very different. Um, so before Gina asks, I'm actually intrigued to know, Jenny, why are you a woman that my mother warns me about? Very good question. I was actually talking with somebody about this because they were talking about um, the glass ceiling and how they feel like it's imposter syndrome and they show up every day being afraid. I actually wrote my high school senior thesis about how a glass ceiling did not actually exist. And it was something made up to hold women down and kind of create the imposter syndrome in them. And I had three teachers pull me aside trying to convince me I was wrong. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I think just from a very young age, I believed that there are no limits. And I've proven that to myself. Any goal that I set, I've been able to accomplish. Was there anything that made you think from a young age other than that? Like, did you grow up around strong women? Who's your woman kind of mentor or role model? Oh, my mom, for sure. My mom is amazing. So she 
found out she was pregnant the summer after graduating high school, got married to my dad. They've now been married 45 years. Wow. Yeah, three kids. I'm the middle. Um, But she was a stay-at-home mom until my younger sister went to kindergarten. And then she went back to get her degree, became a teacher, went on to get her master, multiple masters. Um, And she really very much is the embodiment of designing your own life and figuring out what you want um, and finding that path forward. But she also encouraged me. So I started my first web design company at um, in seventh grade because I grew up on a farm. And the rule was either you work outside or you make money otherwise, but I couldn't drive or ride a bike to babysit. And that was the only other way to make money. So I taught myself how to hand code websites and started doing websites for all the local churches and school districts. And my mom took me to an accountant and she said, if you're going to do a business, you need to do it properly. So they explained all about taxes, contracts. I was 12. (laughs) So Amazing woman because she wow. knew how to encourage me without doing it for me, which was really empowering. That is so cool. I love that. Wow. The girl who lived on the farm who learned to decode <laughs> tech models. So uh, your brain must be much more technically advanced than mine. And I'm because I'm a recruiter, I'm wow. learning more and more about how tech platforms, like, for example, you've got Uber. You've now got um, tech platforms that are for recruiters. So say, for example, Mm -hmm. if I wanted to book a teacher, I could go onto this app the night before and a teacher would come to my school the next day. Um, But that's only just starting. Where do you think the world is going to go with tech? What what surprises? Can you give us an insight to what what we might see in the the world of tech? Well, that is such an interesting question. I think there's actually going to be a leveling off of how much technology people want in their lives. I think that's Mm -hmm. going to be the most surprising thing. Um, Because, for example, machine learning and artificial intelligence has some really amazing capabilities. And when you watch shows um, like Severance, for example, have you guys seen that show? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, my gosh. It's a new, I think it's an Apple series where you actually can divide your brain to your work self and your personal self. And what? Yeah. And that way, when you get home at night, you don't even think about work because you don't know what you do during the day. Is this a pill I can take? (laughs) What's like, interesting is exactly that, right? Like we I want this. That. I don't know that people actually do though, right? Like I think we're going to start figuring out consequences to having intelligence be in our lives to that level. And we're all going to start pushing back to a little bit more of normalcy. At least that's what I hope because I'm a big believer and proponent in technology, but also in privacy um, and real relationships. So yes, now I need to go. I need to go watch this show. You're going to love it. You do. Mm-hmm. You do need to go and watch that show. I mean, I can definitely see why that might benefit you, Gina. Um, Mrs. I work on Sundays. And also one thing that um, I, I thought was quite exciting about your, your profile, Jenny, um, was that in 2018, you were female entrepreneur yeah. of the year. I want to hear about this and your Stevie Award. I was. Yeah. So I started the agency, uh, like I said, seven years ago, and we grew really, really fast. So the focus in healthcare was really great for us. And we um, doubled in revenue for three years in a row. And we ended up in 2019 being named the number one fastest growing company in St. Louis. Wow. Um, Like the number one in the whole town. Um, And then we made all of the like Inc. 500 fastest growing lists. And so as a result of that, I was ended up being named um, one of the entrepreneurs of the year, which was a nice honor. How um, I love how modestly she says that, by the way. (laughs) And and I know, Susanna, you, you know, you have not been to St. Louis, Missouri, but I mean, St. Louis is like the epicenter of wholesome America. Like it is, you know, the Midwest farm farm girl world <laughs> like it is such a it's it makes sense for her to be so modest in my opinion why healthcare number one like mm-hmm. what got you motivated to do that and what uh, got you to grow so fast so two-part mm-hmm. question there because we are all about the sales here so how'd you grow so fast yeah so first I'll do the why healthcare so um, I'm sure if anybody who's listening to this that's ever done marketing has ever had that feeling of marketing a product or a service that feels gross. Like you don't respect or like the person running the company. You don't like where the money is going. You're introducing people to a product that maybe you don't have faith in. Doing work in healthcare is the opposite. I mean, I literally feel like every day I'm doing the best I can to help make somebody's life better. Mm. Um, so 
what we have done is we've set a five-year goal where we, we want to positively impact 100 million patient touch points. So like website visits, emails they've opened or received from a provider, Google searches, and then 10 million patient appointments scheduled. Because I imagine um, like my sister having a bad medical diagnosis, going to her computer, trying to find another doctor for a second opinion, making that experience as positive as possible for her in her moment of being completely emotionally overwhelmed is a small way that I can give back. So with the healthcare, it just feels really good to be able to do that. So that's why we focus there. Cool. As far as growing quickly, um, I am really good at listening to what people need and figuring out solutions quickly. So my team jokes that I come up with ideas and just throw them over my shoulder while I'm running and like, don't even look back to see if somebody caught the idea because I'm just running down the road. Isn't that normal? That's normal, right? <laughs> well, it is <laughs> healthy when you have a right hand person that can catch all of those things and implement it to prevent chaos. So I have that in place now. I actually brought in a woman who I've been friends with 18 years ago. I hired her out of college. We were coworkers parted ways uh, to go on to our next challenges and came back around. 18 go- years ago, you what? what 18, 18. How long have yeah. you been in business? So I've only been in business seven years. OK, I was uh, like 18 years ago. You look like you're 18. No offense, but I, I just I'm trying to do well, the math. I'm, the filter. I'm 38. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, wow. No Shut way. Up. You are older than me. You look younger than me. I need whatever you're taking. What are you taking? Everything. What are you what are you not drinking? Yeah, exactly. I'm so sorry. I just totally red herring you and took you down another path. So go back to your story about your friend that you sorry. brought in. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. So I brought her in to be able to handle and actually make sure the growth was healthy and be more burning our employees out to be really focused on culture and core values. We're at the point now that except for super technical roles where the skill sets are very difficult to find. We post in the open position and employees refer their friends to come mm-hmm. work for us. So we're growing really easily. And- nice. And- That's great. What, uh, tell us a little bit about your sales team and how you, how you enable that. What does that look like? So the interesting thing is we've done all of this with only two salespeople, one wow. of them being itself. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the ways that we get clients um, most often actually is I speak at a lot of industry conferences, Mm -hmm. but I bring my clients with me. So for example, um, a few years ago, I did a presentation with St. Louis Children's Hospital around how to use your YouTube channel to be able to drive awareness for specialty service lines. So my client was up there with me, totally getting all of the credit for all of their smart ideas. And I just helped talk about technical execution. And so then that makes people want to work with you more because you're not pushy at all and you're shining the light on someone else. You're like that technical know-how behind. OMG, this is this is a brilliant nugget. It works really well. Seriously, this is so brilliant. I mean, it takes sometimes a lot to to like wow me over. <laughs> this is this is a big one. I think this is such a game changer. I'm a huge advocate of going out and speaking and kind of having that organic feel that gets you know that engages people and gets them curious to know more about you and work with you and testimonials are great, but I have never, ever, ever in all my years thought of bringing a client with and spotlighting them that kudos way to go. Thank you. And what I found now, I have clients asking me to do presentations with us because they've seen how much publicity the other clients yes. have. Seen. Yeah. And I, I love it. I it's love genius. highlighting them. It feels so good. Again, just like focusing in healthcare, you're doing something good for somebody else. Yeah. All you're doing is good, positive karma things. And then it just comes back and pays dividends. You're putting them on stage, essentially, yeah. giving them that. Well, we spoke about branding. I actually find this really fascinating because obviously in the, in the UK, our healthcare system is very different to yours. You know, it's more like a business there. It's more everyone has their. The positives are that you've all got all, each hospital has got its own identity and they can kind of stand out and market themselves in a different way. Um, you know, just completely different. One thing that really I wanted to, you to expand on, we, we digressed. We often digress. It's usually my <laughs> this fault. Is how it's the usually show, my this fault. This is how the show goes. <laughs> it's usually my fault. Um, but <laughs> when you were talking at the very beginning um, about rebranding, I thought that that was a really interesting topic. And I had a few questions around that because we at Sales Gravy do coaching. And one thing that often comes up is brand and 
about how to create that brand. But what often doesn't come up as often as it should do is rebranding. Yeah. Um, so when would you say, a com- how does a company know that they need to rebrand since it's something you're going through right now? So for us, it was multiple people, including our clients, told us your brand doesn't fit you. It's confusing. It, it doesn't make sense. Anvils are heavy and dark and gray and you guys are light and bubbly and a joy. So not only does that wear not fit you, but you do so much more than analytics and insights. You run our whole digital marketing strategy and execution. You're really pigeonholing yourselves. So just like when I sell, I just listen to the clients and customers. And so I wanted to wait until Maggie had joined my new right hand. Um, I say new, it's almost been a year, but um, I wanted to wait for her to come on board for us to get a little bit of operational efficiencies and structure in place. And then we wanted to go into the rebrand. So it's been a really great year and I'm excited to see what sort of impact it has. Because one of the things that I think is important to know is like, I care more about my brand than anybody else does, right? Like most people don't care what your brand is. They would work with us if our name was Water Bottle Marketing Agency, <laughs> right? If you do good work, we're going to do good work. But for us, the rebrand was as much for employee excitement to have them be, ex- be part of a community as it was to have a brand we felt better represented us. So I don't think it's going to all of a sudden change our sales trajectory or impact like word of mouth because that's going to happen anyway. So I would never encourage somebody to go down the path of a rebrand for that reason. Yeah, I was to say, what are some reasons to go down the path of a rebrand, right? I did a rebrand because it was confusing for my yeah. audience. And that made a, that was a really good reason to do a rebrand. Um, you did a rebrand because it sounds it was more of a, a cultural thing to excite your, the, your company internally, um, which I think does have a financial impact down the road, right? That creating that culture that everybody buys into is excited about, especially, at, you know, Susanna could talk about recruiting, but we know that when we have a really good workplace that, that employees are like, hey, come work over here. This is awesome. Right. That's the culture we want people to to come into. Right. So some very those are very specific reasons right there. But what would be some other reasons for someone to consider a rebrand? Um, I mean, I think the obvious as far as uh, if culture has shifted and the name you had chosen is no longer culturally appropriate. Like I think of Lady Antebellum, the musical mm-hmm. group. They're now Lady yeah. A. Yeah. Because. <laughs> Culture shifted and they did not know all the history. So now they changed it. Um, So that is a a pretty good one. Um, But I'd say the one that you talked about is just one of the biggest is um, confusion or lack of clarity. I also see a lot of people like in the in the hospital systems. One of the things that we help people with quite often that is kind of a component of rebrand is whenever they buy additional hospital systems and you think about the technical implementations. Mm -hmm of rolling everything up into one, a big decision is do we do the rebrand or not based off of the technical lift that has to happen. So that's yeah. another consideration. Yeah. No. Awesome. Often I think, you know, it is that synchronicity, isn't it, between who you uh, think you are and who other people think you are. If there's not if they're not aligned, then there is confusion. And then you, you what do you stand for? Your brain almost kind of just goes a bit more into overload okay right. what am I what am I buying here I don't quite understand so you know I, I I think a lot of people actually my opinion is that a lot of people don't think enough about branding yeah. um and you know absolutely the people the sales thinking about that side of it but you know being your own brand as well and having the confidence to have your own brand mm-hmm. is something that a lot of people struggle with now, I know Gina has some great advice on this because I have sat in coaching <laughs> with her where she's helped helped to brand, um, helped people with their personal branding. But if you guys were to come up with biggest bit of advice for any listeners who think, I don't know my brand. Are you talking personal brand, what, Susanna? Yeah. So, for example, if someone, an accountant was setting up on their own or, um, I don't know, someone was setting up their own agency for advertising, 
how would they go about? Because I bet there's lots of entrepreneurs listening to well, this. And I want to add to that because it's not, in my opinion, it's not just about entrepreneurs. This is why I talk about personal branding all the time. As salespeople, you're the CEO of your revenue stream. And right. this is why I'm so big into the personal brand piece of it. So I think it's, um, let's, let's uh, expand it, expand it for Jenny. Yeah. That's great. So I actually, uh, it took me quite a while to get to this point, but I think finding out who you actually are as a human being, what your core values mm -hmm. are, and that is your brand. I mean, I think it took me until I was probably 32, 33, until I was comfortable being who I was because I thought I had to um, like fit into this little mm -hmm. box and especially being in the Midwest, I want to make everybody yeah. happy. I'm a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually being myself and it's small little things, right? Getting a nose ring, little tattoos, wearing whatever earrings I wanted, no matter how loud they are. All these little things that add up to me being who I am, talking about content and issues that are relevant and mean things to me. You start attracting people with similar energy or, or at least people that respect your energy. And all of your interactions are so much more meaningful than if you're trying to be something or someone that you're not. Yeah. What do, what do you have to add to that, Gina? I'm just, I just, I, yeah, I love I all this. <laughs> well, you know how I feel. I think about it, Susanna. Again, going back to personal brand, who, who are you, number one, like Jenny said, but who, also, who are you trying to attract? And it, it's kind of like a, um, what are they called? I always screw it up. A Venn, di Venn, a Venn diagram? diagram? Yeah, you know where I was going, wow. Jenny, right? <laughs> right? You saw me. Because I think I called it a Zen yeah. diagram once. And I was like, I meant Venn. 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 Close enough. Venn. It's close. Venn and Zen. Because if you have a good <laughs> Venn, you'll be in Zen. So yes. it's that intersection of like who you are and who are you trying to attract. And this is like a yeah. thing that makes me totally crazy. And sometimes I will coach people on this. I'm like, who are you trying to? to attract. Yeah. Right. And then is who you are attracting that. And I'm not saying that you should change who you are, but there's got to be some level of congruency. Right. So when we started this podcast, I'm like, we may offend people. We may <laughs> lose people. We may repel people. We may, because one of the questions was, aren't you afraid you'll lose clients? And I'm like, no, because I'll gain clients, right? So I may lose some on one side, but when I start to own who it is I am and who I want to work with, that just makes the marketing so much easier. So I think you got to be really clear on who you're trying to target, which I see this over and over again, people being unclear about who they're targeting. That's why I asked Jenny the question, why healthcare, right? Very specific, very focused, that probably makes your job that much easier, Jenny. And then who you are, people are going to be attracted to that. I don't know. Did that answer mm -hmm. the question, Susanna? I think so. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. I'm just, I'm just inspired, I guess. I think, and I completely agree with what you say um, about other people. Uh, the moment you, you talked, Jenny, about in your 30s, that was kind of like the moment where you became comfortable with yourself. I think for me, a turning point was when I was watching Big Brother um, you've seen Big Brother, right? Mm -hmm. You have it over there. Yep. Um, yeah. And you you could hear all these people listening to people saying awful things about them. Oh, she's so annoying. She's so, and they've been really hurt by it. And I, it clicked. I suddenly thought to myself, there's probably a whole load of people who say really bad things about me. And that's okay. That's normal. That's Actually, their perception. I asked that's you not culture. to bring this up. Why are you, why are you talking about I didn't, I didn't mean the things I said I about you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always listening. I'm always listening. But that's just it, isn't it? I think, and this is the one thing that, for example, with my kids, I want to teach them because I think it's really important to just not be worried all the time, but to accept it's going to hurt you. There are going to be things that people say and then realize it's okay because so many, so many people spend so long worrying and in business about feedback. I've seen so many teams resist the chance to ask for feedback from their clients because they're scared of what they might get. Um, it's that Jahari's window model, isn't it? Your blind spot. We're often afraid of that blind spot, but sometimes just saying, hey, I might not have a mirror there all the time, but if I did, I might not always like it and that's okay. <laughs> you know, it's being comfortable with that. You know, a little exercise that I've done a gazillion times and I've given to clients a gazillion times is the, I, I, I don't know if I've talked about it with you on the show, Susanna, but the the three words exercise. 
Mm. The uh, go out, go out and ask three friends, three colleagues, and three family members. Right, so nine people. Go ask them to give you a word that comes to mind when they think of you, and they actually have to each give three words. So you, in essence, are like collecting a lot of words. You're collecting like I don't know. I'm bad at math. Nine people. Three words, 27 words, right? So you collect those 27 words and you could do more or less, but you look for the pattern, right? That comes up over and over again. And so like you collect those words and then you like count them up, right? And for me, um, the word bold came up the most, right? So when I was doing my um, rebrand, actually when I was doing the Gina Tremarco brand, which uh, for my website, ginatremarco.com, Right. That that bold word came up so much that I'm like, all right, that's how people see me. And yes, I am. Um, But you also want to make sure that you're congruent. Like Mm -hmm. they may see you one way. You may see yourself another way. But if you're marketing yourself the way you see yourself and not the way other people see you, there's going to be a complete disconnect. Ah. So just a little just a fun little exercise to do. I'm totally doing it. Are you you going to do it? (laughs) Yeah, I like writing it down. I'm absolutely, that's my assignment for this week is to get my 27 words. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to have to report Love back it. to us. It's fun. It's fun because then yeah. you have to pick the top three words. So you got, you counted up and what were yep. the top three words that came back? And does that sound right? So I think mine were bold, fun, and something like determined or, you know, I don't know if it was mm-hmm. bullheaded or determined, something along those lines. I don't know. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that's my, that's my tip for the day. Um, Susanna, do you have some of the, your famous, uh, show ending questions to ask today? Oh, we're going to the end, are we? Yeah, I know it went by <laughs> really just fast. Getting, just getting excited. Just getting excited. <laughs> so Jenny, at the end of the podcast, I've started doing just for fun, a random, would you rather question? Yeah. Have you ever done that before? Would you rather? Like two alternatives. Oh, what are you oh, about yeah. to? My kid all the time. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And we've got a bit of a different one today. I want you to imagine. Let's say, for example, we're living in the ancient times, and we don't have all the awesome stuff that we have today, like technology and I don't know machines. Um, would you rather sew your clothes or grow all your food? We'll grow all my food for sure. I'm a foodie. I love food. It makes my life worth living. <laughs> I absolutely would get joy out of growing my food. Would you? Mm-hmm. So that does make sense. Living on a farm. Yeah, I can see that. What food would you grow? Um, well, my uh, grandpa actually was a cattle farmer. So we actually grew animals um, <laughs> for bees. But then I have a really robust vegetable and fruit garden that I do every year. My husband built me a huge raised bed. Um, and it's kind of cool because our tomatoes get so tall. We built it right next to up to our fence in our community that goes over and it feeds everybody. Everybody walks by and picks tomatoes off of it at the end nice. of the year because we can't keep up with it. So it's really cool. But we oh make like salsas and pickles and. Oh, my word. I've got this image of you as a 12 year old girl now <laughs> decoding, decoding all of these like <laughs> codes and like growing these tomatoes, like being like, Woo, I love this. I love this. Um, <laughs> Well, I do tomatoes. That's now. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm coming now. to visit you when I go to America. Sounds awesome. Love I love tomatoes. You. Um, <laughs> and Gina, what about you? I knew you were going to ask me. And I was like, oh, gosh, I don't want to get my hands dirty. So that was a, that was an <laughs> issue. I'm like, you know, then that means I get dirt under my nails. So mm-hmm. oh, you're one of those, I, those nail ladies. I'm a okay. princess a little bit. Um, but. I don't like sewing, so I don't, I constantly will poke my finger with a needle and I'm not good at it. And that seems like a lot of work. So I had to think through this. What is the least amount of work? Cause I can wash the dirt from underneath my nail. So I'm going to vote for grow my own food. Wow. You will not be an excited farmer. I see it now. <laughs> you yeah. <laughs> Mad at the bugs, mad at the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I, I would enlist somebody for help. 
She does, and she would. And why not? Why not? That's what I would do because my fiance. I've used the word for the first time. He's a foodie and loves to cook. So I think I could enlist his help. Totally yeah. growing the food. He would be happy to because she'd be wearing no clothes because she wouldn't be sewing them. <laughs> so. <laughs> Although I don't know, the new house that we're moving into has a community garden. I was like, oh, oh look, he's like, like you're going to be out there growing. I'm like, you don't know, no, it could happen. Now maybe I will. I'm going to prove them wrong. I love this. Anna, how about you? What's your answer? Well, I always like to predict the guests' answers in advance, and I <laughs> predicted wrong on this on this occasion. Dang. I thought that you guys would be agreeing with me and sewing your own clothes because I am an old folky. I love sewing. Oh. I love cross stitch. I don't do it because I don't have time. But if I did, <laughs> I would. <laughs> and it's so calming. Um, I recommend it. You know I what? I, I, we could live in a commune together. You could sew all the clothes and we could grow the food. Yep. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Brilliant. I look forward to it. Make me good food. Good vegetables, good beetroot. We will, we will. Jenny, it's been a pleasure having you on The Women Your Mother Warned You About. Sponsored, by the way, by Sales Gravy and Sales Gravy University. If people want to reach out to you, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, I'd love for people to get in touch with me afterwards. There are four great ways to get in touch with me. First, you can visit my agency's new website, hedyandhoff.com. That's H-E-D-Y-A-N-D-H-O-P-P.com. Shoot me an email at jenny at hedyandhoff.com. Find me on LinkedIn. Um, I publish content pretty regularly about healthcare and the different innovations happening in the space. But then also, we've also launched our own podcast um, a while ago. We're a handful of episodes in and we're making some really great connections. I'd love for your listeners to tune in. They can search for We Are Marketing Happy on whatever platform they listen to their podcasts. And then we also have the videos available on our YouTube channel. But each week we invite a different guest that is making waves in the healthcare space and improving the way that patients access care. So we've had topics ranging from um, artificial intelligence, remote patient monitoring, uh, changing the digital front door for patients. So we're having a lot of really fun conversations and I'd love for folks to tune in. Fantastic. It's been a pleasure having you here. For more information about our show, Warners, go to womenyourmotherwarnsyoubout.com and you'll find all of our socials there. And of course, check us out at salesgravy.com and check out our courses, which are constantly changing every month, our live courses. And then of course we have our self-paced courses. Susanna, any final words from you? Nothing but time is precious. And we are so, we, we are so grateful that you came to join us. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jenny. Bye Warners. Bye. Bye.